uh, let's do this. Well, welcome to episode 53 of The Past and the Curious. My name is Mick Sullivan, and this is my thing, yo. This episode is about Sophie Blanchard and Willa Brown, two women who made history in the air. Some, some great stuff. Uh, I'm really glad that you're out there. I love making this show, and I keep hearing from people that they wish that I could make it faster. And believe you me, I wish that were true, too. But, you know, I've got a job and a family, and it's a lot of work to create. So for the most part, I do the writing and the editing and most of the reading. All that takes time. So I thank you for bearing with me in the usually month between the shows. Uh, but speaking of reading, I do have some guests reading this month. My friend Lindy Prickett sent her voice to me all the way from India. She and her daughter host a great show called Newsy Jacuzzi, and I'm a big fan. I recommend it, especially if you're looking for a kid-centered current events show. That'll be Lindy's voice you hear on the story about Sophie Blanchard. Now, also lending her voice to the story about Willa Brown and actually voicing Willa Brown on a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt is Madison Smith from the All Things Madison podcast, a new kids listen friend that we've made. So let's get started. It's never a good thing to wake up with icicles on your nose, especially when you're alone in the basket of a balloon. But here was Sophie Blanchard, cold, a little confused, but luckily alive, and still dangling safely above the jagged earth. Ballooning at night was a favorite way to travel for her, but perhaps crossing the Alps was not her wisest decision. There was a good chance she might never have woken up after passing out from the combination of cold temperatures and low oxygen at the high altitude the journey required. But if we're being honest, it was her bravery and airborne grace that were celebrated. She was not well known for her safe decisions. Of course, this is the attitude typical of a daredevil, and Sophie was the most famous daredevil in 19th century France. Perhaps more remarkable than her airborne antics is the way she was unfailingly adored by everyone, despite France suffering through decades of frightening political chaos. She witnessed and survived the French Revolution, a time when so many others lost their heads to the guillotine. After the heads of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette fell victim to this sharp new device, a man with no noble blood but a firmly attached head wound up in charge. He was known as Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, and he was a huge fan of Sophie's aeronautics. Years later, France was in turmoil again, and he was exiled, sent away to make room for a new head on which to rest the crown. The royal family was reinstalled on the throne, and luckily the new monarch, King Louis XVIII, was as fond of Sophie as everyone else had been. As the country dramatically changed, she was a constant, a point of pride, and a woman of wonder. She didn't start out as Wonder Woman, though. She started out as a nervous girl. It's said that she was not only painfully shy, but also afraid of nearly everything she'd encounter in public. As a kid, she was terrified of huge horses and bouncing carts that clogged the cobbled streets. She never really grew out of it. Sudden loud noises make her jump even reduce her to tears. A simple trip to the market could leave her in a poor state on account of the overwhelming amount of frightening things she encountered. She was small, tiny in fact, and as a young woman, no one would have predicted the big things she would do or the heights to which she would soar. She married a man named Jean-Pierre Blanchard. Jean-Pierre was famous. He was also a terrible businessman and pretty full of himself. But he was the leading aeronaut of the day, which is what they called balloonists at the time. He had done a lot of things with his hydrogen balloon, including flying across the English Channel from England to France. This was the first international flight. But somewhere over the salty water, he and his co-pilot realized they had too much weight in the basket. The men had to throw everything they'd brought with them over the side, even their clothes. So some of his fame may have stemmed from the fact that he flew into France in his underwear. 
His accomplishments were greater than that, but that's a tough one to live down. In 1804, he took 25-year-old Sophie for her first flight. To the people who knew her, it was an absolute wonder that she'd said yes. If a horse and carriage horrified her to no end, a basket dangling from a balloon high above the ground seemed even more horrifying. But she didn't bat an eye. And what she found in the air was peace, quiet, and a thrilling new perspective on the world. She was hooked, and soon after they made a second trip to the clouds above France. The third time she made an ascent, she was alone. Sophie Blanchard became the first woman to make a solo flight in a balloon. Jean-Pierre made his money by flying balloons for events or having people pay to join him in the air. Ballooning was popular in France, but though he was the best, he had plenty of competition. The competition cut into his profit. To make matters worse, he was terrible with money and owed plenty of it to other people. He and Sophie realized a young woman daring enough to take to the clouds might attract some attention and money. So she joined him, making balloons the family business. But there were highs and lows. One crash left Jean-Pierre unconscious and Sophie in such shock that she was unable to speak for weeks. They recovered and undaunted, they returned to the skies. But not long after that, Jean-Pierre had a heart attack while they dangled from the balloon. He'd die soon after, leaving Sophie in terrible debt thanks to his mismanaged money. He didn't have much hope for her prospects as he was on his deathbed, but while she would miss him, she knew she'd probably be better at the business side of things than he was. Turns out she was better at the ballooning too. In a short amount of time, she'd flown enough flights, been hired enough times, and was smart enough with her spending that she paid off all the debt Jean-Pierre had left. From that point on, it was life in the clouds for her. Oftentimes, she would take to the skies in the beautiful balloon wearing a white dress and a white hat adorned with white ostrich feathers. From the ground, she looked like an angel and her fame grew. Napoleon adored her and everything she represented. She embodied all the glory of France, so he hired her as the official balloonist of festivals. One day in 1811, thousands of papers flapped and fluttered as they rained down from the sky above Paris. Napoleon had been so excited about the birth of his son that he'd hired Sophie to drop the leaflets from her balloon, announcing the arrival of Napoleon Francois Joseph Charles Bonaparte. One of Sophie's advantages as a balloonist and one that helped her save money was her diminutive size. The first balloons in France were made by Montgolfier brothers and were lifted by hot air. Sophie's balloon was lifted by hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest element on the periodic table. It's gaseous and lighter than air. So when she filled her balloon with it, the balloon would lift into the skies. Hydrogen wasn't cheap in the 1880s, though. But Sophie was able to use less of it than her aeronauts because she needed less of it to get her balloon and herself up in the air. This also helped her on long-distance flights for which her international fame grew. You may have heard of the famous German Zeppelin airship, or blimp, from the 1900s, known as the Hindenburg. If you've heard of it, you might recall the disaster that brought it crashing down from the skies over America. Like Sophie's balloon, it was filled with hydrogen. And while it is liftingly light, hydrogen is also very, very flammable. Remember how maybe Sophie wasn't regarded so much for her wise decisions as she was her daring acts? Well, one of the acts she dared to do involved an early version of fireworks, which she would light from the basket of her hydrogen balloon. Do you see where we're going with this? It must have been quite a sight. Any of the dozens of times she successfully dropped fireworks on little parachutes and waved wands of colored flames from her basket. But it only takes one mistake for everything to come to a dramatic conclusion. On July 6, 1819, 
her balloon caught fire in midair. At first, people thought it was part of the show. In the balloon, Sophie had every reason to panic, but she kept her head, and for a few tense minutes, it looked like she might have been able to save herself. Unfortunately, during her hasty descent, the top of a building upset the basket of her balloon and sent her falling. Death is always a possibility for daredevils, and Sophie was no different. She fell to the street, and her city and country immediately mourned her. Though she had inherited the family balloon business and a mountain of debt, she died a wealthy woman. Having no family, the will she had made gave her fortune to the young daughter of a friend. It was quite a gift, but it was nothing compared to the gift she gave, not just to France and not just to the growing field of aeronautics, but to women everywhere who knew they belonged anywhere they wanted to be, even in the clouds. Okay, it's time for You Have 30 Seconds, and this month we're welcoming Knut from Duluth, Minnesota. Hello, my name is Knut. The 97-year-old Duluth Zoo started as a game park, but during construction, plans were changed. Bears were acquired by trapping them when they wandered into town. The zoo's most famous resident was named Mr. Magoo. Magoo. John F. Kennedy pardoned Mr. Magoo. In 2012, a tragic flood killed multiple animals and and, um, freed a tiger that was recaptured in downtown. Thanks, Knut. I love a good zoo story. What's not to love about that? That's awesome. Uh, Thank you for sharing that. And if you have something to share, you have 30 seconds to share it with us. All you need is a phone or something to record it with, and you can email it to us. There's instructions on our website. Can't wait to hear what you have to share. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. Time, time. It's a quiz about things that fly. What else would you expect? Here it is, number one. In 1783, the Montgolfier brothers launched the first hot air balloon flight with living creatures aboard. In total, there were three living beings in this basket. Can you name any or all three of these creatures in the history-making balloon? The flight was tethered, meaning the balloon was tied to the ground, so it couldn't float away and they could get it back easily. Which is good, because some of the creatures aboard might not have been able to get back down on their own. Though it was tethered, only a few of these critters were feathered. Inside were a rooster, a duck, and a sheep. The sheep was believed to be close enough to the form of a human that it might give a good idea of what would happen to a person in flight, which they didn't really know. The flight was requested by King Louis XVI. Marie Antoinette was also there to see. And by the way, no animals were harmed in the making of this story. They all made it back safe and sound. Question number two. Of course, the Wright brothers are remembered as pioneers in the development of airplanes. When they made their first historic flight at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, their airplane could only hold one of the brothers. How did they decide who would be the first one to fly? In 2001, the United States Mint released the North Carolina State Quarter, featuring the Wright Brothers' historic moment on the obverse, or the backside of the coin. This is appropriate because flipping a coin is how they decided who would get to make history. Older brother Orville won the coin toss and crashed the plane. After they fixed it, he tried again three days later, And this time, he had his successful flight, the history-making flight. Afterwards, his brother got a chance to fly as well. They took turns several times. So though Orville was first, Wilbur did fly farther, which uh, gave them both something to antagonize each other about, which is something that brothers would probably do. Okay, question number three. In 2012, a football quarterback named Joe Ayub set the world record for distance flown by a paper airplane. The plane was designed and folded by John Collins. Now, I don't expect that anyone will get this exactly, but if you're listening with someone else, well, maybe have everyone wager a guess and see who gets the closest. How long was the farthest paper airplane flight? (laughs) 
Sometimes I wonder if people like press pause in between these questions to talk about it. If you do, let me know. Anyway, here's the answer. The record setting paper airplane flight took place at McClellan Air Force Base inside of a hangar so that they could cut down on wind and other interference. And the result was a flight of 226 feet and 10 inches. Before the United States Air Force ever existed, there was the U.S. Army Air Corps, or the AAC for short. And at its inception, all of the American pilots who would fly for the AAC were white. In the years before World War II, aviation in America was wildly exciting thanks to people like Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. Large numbers of young, would-be pilots were inspired to learn to fly, and their landing place was typically in Army jobs. Black Americans of the 1920s and 1930s were no different in their dreams of flight, but the path wasn't so clearly laid out. And while Lindbergh and Earhart might have been front page news, there were plenty of other inspirational figures, including some remarkable airborne black Americans who didn't get the same notoriety, at least not in the white newspapers of the day. Eugene Bullard was born in Georgia, but left for Europe to avoid the racism of the South in the early 1900s. Learning to fly in France, he became one of the most decorated fighter pilots of World War I while flying for the French Air Force. His legend in America grew, thanks to some good friends, including Louis Armstrong. And of course, Bessie Coleman would be the first black woman to earn a pilot's license. But she, like Bullard, had to go to France to earn that license. The difference, of course, is that Bessie came back to America and was a star of the barnstorming shows. She was a celebrity, and her sudden death was a sad shock to many people who admired her. One of those people was Willa Brown. Willa was born in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1906. Like much of America, Bowling Green was largely segregated at this time, meaning black citizens and white citizens were not allowed equal access to most things. Education was one of those things, and education was very important to Willa's family. When they moved to Terre Haute, Indiana, she attended one of the best schools in the area, an unsegregated school with white and black students learning together. Upon graduating high school, she immediately went to college for what was called business professional school. This trained young women for jobs that would have bored Willa to tears. So she became a teacher instead. For many years, she taught high school in Gary, Indiana. She pushed her students, found funding for new equipment like typewriters, and got the kids placed in the community to learn from professionals and set them up for future employment. And it was around this time that she fell in love with Bessie Coleman's story, which, by the way, we have featured on a past episode of The Past and the Curious. Bessie's march toward conquering the skies had begun in Chicago, and this was not far from Gary, Indiana. Willa applied for a master's degree program at Northwestern University in Chicago. And one day, while earning some extra money as a cashier, she met a young black man named Cornelius Coffey, who casually mentioned that he was a pilot. Not just that, he was a certified airplane mechanic and was licensed to recruit new pilots for the growing field of flight. So Willa made sure to see him again. In fact, many years later, they'd get married. But before that, she'd learn everything there was to know about the inside of an airplane engine. And after that, she asked to learn how to fly. A major problem developed, though, as Cornelius, the flight trainer, and his business partner had a difficult time finding an airport that would rent planes to black trainees, or even allow them on site. Through connections, they found some community support and opened their own hangar, the Challengers Aero Club. This would allow them to reach out to new black recruits and get them into the skies. Meanwhile, Willa set her own goals and reached them one by one. In 1935, she became a licensed airplane mechanic. In 1938, she earned a private pilot's license, and in 1939, a commercial pilot's license. Bessie Coleman had been the first black woman with a private license, but remember, she had to go to France to earn it. Willa was the first black American woman to earn a pilot's license in the United States. 
While working closely with Cornelius Coffey, they grew the Little Challengers Aero Club into a national organization. She did everything. She taught flying, she kept books, she did repairs. She even kept the lunch counter in the hangar. Anything to help the bottom line. Before long, they opened the Coffee School of Aeronautics and co-founded the National Airmen's Association of America. Of course, in 1939, the world's attention was on Europe. America was still years away from joining World War II, but that didn't mean the country wasn't getting ready. If they entered the war, they'd need more pilots than they had. Some of America's pilots would fly as fighters. Some would fly transportation flights or haul freight. And some of these wouldn't come back. If America joined the war, there'd be practically no one left to fly in the States. Plus, there would be a need for more pilots overseas to boot. So the U.S. government approved millions of dollars to fund training programs across the country to teach new pilots. Willa fought for the coffee school to be one of those training sites. Just like her high school student body, the coffee school trainees there were unsegregated. That was something Willa felt strongly about, but the government denied the coffee school. Willa did not give up, and many from Chicago's powerful black community backed her. As the president of the National Airmen's Association of America, she was well known, and she never backed down. Many of her trainees remember a teacher who would not accept a mediocre job. Failure just simply was not an option for Willa, and this applied to herself as well. She wrote a letter to First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt explaining what an important role black pilots could play in the war effort, and she knew that they would be needed, she knew that they were capable, and she knew that once they were successful, their success would extend in many directions for generations to come. During the past three years, I've devoted full-time to aviation. And for the most part, progress has been made. I have, however, encountered several difficulties. Several of them I have handled very well. And some have been far too great for me to master. I would like to talk to you sometime if you can spare a few minutes when you're passing to Chicago or if it will please you better sometime in your home in Washington. I come in and out of Washington quite often. You may rest assured any time spent in the inches of my aviation associations will be well appreciated. Sincerely yours, Willa B. Brown. Up until this point, Willa's recruits and trainees were working for the Civil Air Patrol, a federal organization that handled certain flights over America. They could collect and deliver materials for war efforts, but they were not Army fighter pilots. Despite this, these civilians were ready to protect citizens if the war in Europe were to somehow wind up on American soil. But much of that changed with the Tuskegee Airmen, and Willa is often credited as being one of the big reasons the Tuskegee Airmen ever came into existence. Thanks to her lobbying, as well as efforts from leaders of the NAACP and a man named William Hasty Jr., who happened to be the first African-American federal judge, the Army decided to found a squadron of black U.S. Army fighter pilots. They became known as the Tuskegee Airmen, and today they are famous for their efforts both in World War II and for what they represent in civil rights. 200 of the earliest Tuskegee pilots were recruited by and trained with Willa and Cornelius at the Coffee School of Aviation. In 1946, after the war, she ran for Congress on a platform of equal access to resources for all people. She didn't win, and when she ran again four years later in 1950, she lost. However, she was the very first African-American woman to run for Congress in the United States, which was yet another remarkable note on her biography. After this, and after the coffee school closed, Willa showed no signs of stopping. She returned to her first job, teaching high school, which she did for decades in Chicago, including developing an aviation program for her students. What a wonder it must have been for a student to learn who she was and what she had accomplished in her lifetime. She died at the age of 86 in 1992 and is buried in Lincoln Cemetery, the very same cemetery in which Bessie Coleman rests. When she was a young woman just learning to fly, Willa arranged for an annual event to celebrate Bessie Coleman. People gathered at her grave while planes flown by black pilots flew overhead in tribute to her pioneering efforts. It went on for years. And though it stopped for a while, it was rebooted nearly 40 years ago, and it still goes on today 
at the end of April in every year. And it is sponsored by the Chicago chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen. Now, Willa gets to share in the honor alongside her hero, Bessie. So fee, so fair, so high in the air, the cobblestone clatter quietly fades away. So fee, so small, that nothing at all suspends her in the most enchanting. Ground and awful sounds below. Late at night, she made her flights, and so with only the wind for guidance, rose into the silence, the soft and the cool starry glow. So Don't clatter quietly fades away. So fee, so small that nothing at all suspends her in the most enchanting way. The emperor adored her in the war. As did the king when his crown was restored and throwing down ribbons of fire Sophie rose even higher over the mountains she soared so free so fair so high in the air the cobblestone clatter quietly fell Et ensuite, arrostière officielle de la restauration. Timide sur terre, elle était sans peur dans les airs. Dans le cimetière Père Lachaise, on peut lire ces mots inscrits sur sa tombe. Victime de son art et de son intrépidité. Ah, Sophie, la légende de ton courage volera à jamais là-haut, par-dessus les rues bruyantes. Sophie, so fair, so high. Cobblestone clatter quietly fades away. So fee, so small that nothing at all suspends her in a most, suspends her in a most, oh, suspends her. Holy cow, I love that song. Uh, that is by a band named Red Moon Road, and uh, they're from Canada. And I've, it's the first time I heard that song, I fell in love. And uh, 
I sent them an email and I said, hey, I want to use it for this show. I think it would be a perfect fit. And they were super excited to have it included. So thank you to them. And I encourage you to check uh, them out. That song is called Sophie Blanchard, 1778, official aeronaut of the Empire and Restoration. And what a great job it does telling her story and what great musicians they are. Okay, well, we also have a lot of Patreon people to thank. So let me first start with Lilia, Lilia in Minneapolis. Lilia. Uh, I heard that you uh, were going to read the Roosevelt letters to his children for President's Day. Curious to know how you enjoyed those. Lilia, thank you for listening. I'm so glad you're out there. The O'Shea's. Uh, you all are going to get a song next month, but I wanted to say, hey, this month. So, you know, be looking forward to that. Uh, my old friend Jenny Cole and Cactus Jack out there. Uh, thanks for re- re-donating, you know, doing your thing. I appreciate it. I'm so glad means a lot um ben, ben nicholas, nicholas elizabeth, elizabeth in silver springs maryland ben, ben elizabeth, nicholas elizabeth, and silver elizabeth springs, yes yeah. i also got something cool from luke and aaron luke and aaron uh they actually sent me a video of them performing with guitar and everything the quiz time theme song from which was awesome hemisphere. thank you all for sharing that i understand that luke really loves the banjo and mandolins and stuff and I also understand that Aaron really loves the hot dog episode, which, hey, it's a great episode. That's one of my favorite ones, too. So glad you're out there. And thank you for sending that video. That was super cool. Uh, Andrew, 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 Matt, 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 Andrew and Matt Lang. Andrew Hello Matt out Lang. there. I'm so glad that you have joined. Um, I also need to thank Lindy from Newsy Jacuzzi, Madison from All Things Madison. Uh, and uh, I have a birthday shout out that I'm going to do here at the end, too. But I just wanted to note, you hear this song all the time. This song is a is a performance of, by a band that I'm in called Squeezebot, but the song is called Armando's Rumba, and it is by a musician named Chick Corea, who just happened to pass away um, about a week ago or two weeks ago from the time of this recording. So in January, or I'm sorry, in February of 20, what month is it? February of 2021. Um, and uh, he's, a, he's a really important person to me, and uh, I just wanted to point that out. So you, people might be curious what that song is, and it's somebody who has been in the news recently. Uh, okay, so we have one more thing. We have a birthday. I need to shout out Henry Eaton. It is your birthday. Happy birthday from me and everyone. Thank you all for listening. I'm so glad you're out there. We'll be back next month with more fun. My name is Mick Sullivan. And oh, also thanks to Red Moon Road. Yeah. Yeah. You all are awesome. Appreciate your help. My name is Mick Sullivan. This has been The Past and the Curious. Be nice. <laughs>